Earlier today, we were discussing world mythologies, and we went over the mythologies of ancient Egypt and ancient Samaria. And in particular, we are focusing on the creation stories. Now, in part two, we're going to be covering the most famous creation story ever, which comes from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Now, in the book of Genesis, the opening lines read something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless void. Now, most people have interpreted that to mean that in the beginning, there was only God and nothing else. And God created the heavens and the earth from nothingness. Now, in truth, that's not the position you have in the Hebrew Bible. What you actually have is something very similar to what we saw in ancient Egypt and Sumeria. So you have what's called a three-story universe. Why a three-story universe? Because you have three elements, just like in a building, a three-story building. So you've got the top element, which is the sky, the middle, earth, and the oceans. And then there's always an underworld. The underworld is not, though, a hell situation. It's just where everybody goes, like a shadow realm when they die. So it doesn't necessarily have any negative uh, moral implications or connotations. Now, continuing on in the book of Genesis, in Genesis 1-6, you read, God created a dome that would separate the waters from the waters. Now, that seems baffling. What on earth could that possibly mean? It's very clear if you think about it from a viewpoint of people thousands of years ago, not from the 21st century. So what needs to happen is a separation of fresh water from salt water. So that's what it means. In the beginning, the waters were commingled together. You had salt water and fresh water. And what God did is we, he literally created a dome made of bronze in the sky. So you can see covering the earth where the fresh water is going to go above the dome and the salt water is going to stay down on earth, surrounding earth. Now, how else could you explain rain in these ancient civilizations? You needed to have fresh water coming from the sky and that's what you get here. God creates a firmament or a dome made of bronze and there's windows. So you have little windows at different stages across the dome and that's how you can have rain that comes down through the dome. Now that's not, that might seem very simplistic to us in the 21st century, but you have to understand that people were doing the best they could based off of the knowledge they had. So they're still using their five senses and their senses told them, well hey, water's coming from the sky, there needs to be some sort of explanation for it. And this also ties into ancient Egypt which we went over in part one, where I talked about how there was a boat that would travel across the sky and carry the Pharaoh and the sun god. Now, that is, you can have that situation because there's a, literally an ocean in the sky of fresh water. So that's why the Pharaohs would have boats, they called them solar barks, that they could travel along. Now, moving along in Genesis, this would be the creation of the cosmos. The other highly contentious point is the creation of humankind. Now, the most interesting component of it is that Genesis states, let us create humankind in our image. Why would there be this plurality if it's just God? That doesn't seem to make any sense. There's a lot of theories for, for the us and the our, for the plurality. The most popular is the angels. So that's what's being referred to. God's talking to the angels and saying that we should make God in our image. But there are other possibilities. It could be like the royal we, 
sort of conception. So it's still really singular. Or it could be about the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's where you have this, this uh, notion of plurality. Another, even more contentious a way to look at it, which I think could be correct, is in a lot of these ancient civilizations, you have a male and a female consort. So in older creation stories, there normally is a pair, and they're both involved in creation in some way. So God, in the Hebrew Bible, does have a female consort, depending on how you want to read it, his Asherah. And that might be what's being referred to, because it states, let us make humankind in our image and in our likeness, both male and female. So when you add that element, it does seem to make it more likely that could, the Hebrew Bible might be referencing the female consort. So that's just a small take on all of the very interesting and unique standpoints in the Hebrew Bible. What should be taken away from this part is that if you look from a 21st century perspective and try and apply modern science to it, there's going to be problems. But if you understand it from the viewpoint of people living 3,000 years ago, it starts to make sense. Even though we might not agree with it today, we can understand what at first might seem strange and bizarre. And it actually is a story that can be found throughout the world, but especially can be found in a very specific form in the ancient Near East. Now, as we move into part three, later today, we're gonna to see that there's a new way of understanding creation. Instead of this old model of having three levels or three stories, we're gonna go into something called emanation, which is where there is one that overflows in concentric rings. That it basically, at the very end, you'll get Earth. It's a new, more philosophical concept that comes out of Greek science. So it's interesting to note, religion and science, they're not always in contention. When you have a new scientific advance, it'll normally push a new religious creation account. And they sort of have a way of working together especially in the ancient world, it's only more recently that they have become at odds with one another. And in our last part, we will discuss how religion and science can actually be put back together in a new way, going over something called emergence and process theology.